morning, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. That's where we find the Lord's Supper in all of this. And uh, today we're going to look at the Lord's Supper and what it should mean to the Christian. What it should mean to us as followers of Jesus Christ and believers in Jesus Christ. What does this whole thing mean of communion and the Lord's Supper or the Lord's table and breaking of bread when we come together? Well, it should mean five things to us here this morning, and I'd like to point those out to you very quickly before we partake of the Lord's Supper. I want you to realize that in the Bible, the Lord's Supper is referred to as four different things. It's got four different names, but it ultimately all means the same thing. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 16, it calls it the communion, our communion with the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? This is a time of communion. That word union comes out of the word communion. You and I are going to commune ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ today. We're going to hitch ourselves up to Jesus Christ just like a trailer hitches itself to a truck. Those two are then in communion. We also see the Bible calls it the breaking of bread. If you look at Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, you see that it says there that they came together on the first day of the week to break bread together. That's referring to the Lord's Supper. We also see it's called in Matthew 26, verses 26 and 27, that it's also referred to as the giving of thanks. I, I find it interesting that God gives it that title as well. Let's not forget as we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper here this morning that we are giving thanks to Jesus Christ for what He did on the cross of Calvary. Amen? We're giving thanks to Him. We're saying, Lord, thank You for what You did. Boy, I'll tell you something. Jesus Christ, if all He did was die for us so that we could go to heaven and then He left us in the gutter that He found us in, that's exactly what we would deserve. But you know, He didn't. He came to give us life and He came to give us it more abundantly, He says. He not only saved us, but He gave us a new life. We became a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ and we ought to thank Him and praise Him for that that His blood was shed on the cross of Calvary and His body was broken for us so many years ago. It's also called what we'll refer to here the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 20. And since you're already there, why don't you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And I want you to realize here in verse number 17, it says this, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. This is actually a passage of Scripture where the Apostle Paul is chastening the church of Corinth for their, uh, for their carnal ways. They become very carnal in their thinking. They become very carnal in their actions. And Paul writes the letter of 1 Corinthians almost as a list of sins that he sees within this carnal group of Christians, right? And he lists all kinds of things that are happening. There's fornication going on in this church. There's division in this church. And one of the things that he sees that's wrong with them is the way that they're partaking of the Lord's Supper. So we know that Paul took time to write this and add this to his list of, of carnal concerns that he had for the church of Corinth. We know that this must be a very serious and sober thing that should be taken by the church if Paul's willing to write a letter of correction about this whole thing. You have to understand the church of Corinth, they were babes in Christ. That was their problem. They were immature Christians. Amen. Amen. It's a good thing every once in a while to take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians and read the book of 1 Corinthians because that is a picture of an immature Christian. And if you see any of those traits that are going on within your life that Paul saw going on in the church of Corinth, well, let me tell you something. Chances are you are probably an immature Christian. Amen? Immature Christian. He says in verse number 18, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Look at what he says in verse number 19. I find this interesting. He says, For there must also 
uh, there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. This is an interesting uh, uh, way that he writes this. He says not only that he hears that there's heresies among these people, but he says, you know, there must be heresies among you. There has to be heresies among you. Why? He gives the reason in verse number 19. He says that they which are approved may be manifest among you. He says, look, there's got to be heresies among believers. You know why? Because those that are adhering to the word of God will be manifest among those heresies, right? And so he goes on and points that out. So we see division here. We see heresies here. We see all kinds of things happening. Look at verse number 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place it is not to eat the Lord's Supper there's our fourth and final title to this whole thing today the fourth and and uh, and final label that God gives to what we're going to be doing today verse number 21 for in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper and one is hungry and another is drunk and he says you guys are all coming together to feed your bellies that's what you're doing with the Lord's Supper and he says that's not what the Lord's Supper is about the Lord's Supper is about glorifying Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord's Supper is about remembering what Christ did for us, Amen. not filling our bellies for carnal satisfaction. He says in verse 22, What have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He says in verse number 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse number 25, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Look at verse 26. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. You do show the Lord's death till he come. Let's go, Lord, in prayer, and let's take a look at this passage of Scripture here this morning and see the five things that God would have us to remember and to think about during this time. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for the work that you did on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we thank you that you, your blood was shed and your body was broken for us and for me, Father. And Lord, we ask and pray that you would help us to be mindful of this as we go through your word this morning. And God, we ask that if there is anything in our lives that do, do not align with what your word tells us today about this, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, that you would get hold of us here today. And Lord, help us to realize that when something is out of alignment, you and your word is the standard. And Lord, we don't change the standard to accommodate us. Amen. Lord, we change ourselves to accommodate the standard. And Father, I pray that would be the attitude in which we would approach this here today. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at the first thing that God would have us to know about the Lord's Supper here this morning. Are you ready? Is everybody together? We've got this here today. And the first thing that the Lord wants us to know about taking the Lord's Supper here today is that, number one, it is a time of memorial. Can you see that up there? It is a time of memorial. What does that mean, a time of memorial? Well, God knows that you and I forget things very, very easily. Amen? God knows that. You know, it's amazing to me that we can have something like what happened on September 11th happen to our country, and now we're just a little over 10 years after that, and it seems like we've totally forgotten what happened. You know, it's interesting that I read a, a recent study about New Yorkers compared to the rest of the country. The rest of the country, after 9-11, 
went into churches and started seeking God and prayed more and went to church more. And now, according to this survey that I read, all of those numbers across the country are back to what they were before 9-11. Does that make sense? Except in one section of the country, in New York, Manhattan particularly, the numbers are still higher than ever of people going to church and praying. You know what that means? That means I'm not saying that they're going to Bible-believing churches. I'm not even saying that they're real Christians. I'm just saying that people in New York are still seeking God. Why? Because they're reminded of 9-11 every single day. Every time they go to work, every time they get in their car, every time they drive down the street, guess what? They're reminded of what happened on September 11th. You and I can forget about it. And so often and so many people in our country have forgotten about it. Turn to Isaiah chapter 17 with me here this morning. Isaiah chapter 17. And I want you to look that is not a, a problem that is common to Americans. It is a problem that is common to humans and to humankind. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 17. It says this in verse number 10. It says, Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. I want you to realize that forgetting what God has done for us is not something that just happens to American Christians. Amen. It's not something that just happens to Europeans. It is something that has happened to God's people since the beginning of time. That's why since we can remember and since we have record of history in the Bible, we see God setting up memorials. Amen? God setting up memorials so that we will not forget. Amen. When the children of Israel passed through the Jordan River, God said, take 12 stones and set them up so that you're always reminded that I'm the one who brought you into the promised land. Amen? Amen? He says, set up those memorials. Don't forget about what I did for you. The Bible says that the Passover is a memorial. He says, I want you to celebrate the Passover so that you remember me bringing you out of Egypt. And I'll tell you something. There are Jews to this day who celebrate Passover, and that's what they remember during that time is how God miraculously delivered them out of Egypt. Are you with me? Yes. Why? It's a memorial. God knows that people forget. Yes. And he says, don't forget. Don't forget how I brought you out of Egypt. Don't forget how I brought you into the promised land. The Bible even tells us that the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, were written as a memorial so that people would not forget. Amen. Amen. And God says here in verse number 10, Be cause thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shall thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. Today, when we take the Lord's Supper, it is for one reason that you and I come together to partake of the Lord's Supper, and that's to remember that what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen. That's why He called this to be done from the time that He left this earth till now, was so that we never forget, because He knows that it's so easy for us to forget what He did. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And look at verse number 24. And I want you to realize that it's a time of memorial so that we will remember, number one, that we will remember His body. Amen? Remember His body which was broken for us. It says in verse 24, And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is My body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of Me. God never wants us to forget how Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross of Calvary. His bones were not broken according to prophecy, but His body was his body was broken for you and for me. They beat him. They smote him. They stabbed him. They put a crown of thorns upon him. 
The Bible says that he was beaten beyond being recognizable as a man. That's what he did for you and for me, that he was broken. His body was broken for us. Go back to Isaiah with me in Isaiah chapter 53. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, and I'd like you to take a moment and just read this passage with me. It's a great reminder of what Jesus Christ went through. It says that he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was bes uh, despised, and we esteemed him not. I love these people who wear these what would Jesus do bracelets and what would Jesus do necklaces, right? What would Jesus do? The Bible says that he was despised and rejected of men. You want to be like Jesus? You want to do what Jesus did? Then it'll cost you. It'll cost you. Despised and rejected of men. It doesn't say loved and accepted of all. That's what we're being told today from behind many a pulpits. Behind many a pulpits, in front of many a pulpits, have a large congregation that those words go out, right? Oh, because if we're going to be followers of Jesus, well, then everybody's going to love us. The Bible says if you'll be like Christ, then you'll be despised and rejected of men. Verse number four, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But notice verse five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. You know, it's so strange to me how so many people read about healing in the Bible, and David talks about healing and all of the healing and the healing and the healing. You know, if you look at the context of most of the times when healing is mentioned, when David talks about it, when the prophets talk about a healing, they're talking about spiritual healing. You and I need to be spiritually healed because we have a very bad spiritual disease, it's called sin. We've all chosen to acquire this disease by our own choices. And Jesus Christ comes in and dies on the cross, and it says that by His stripes you and I are healed. It was the breaking of His body that healed us in verse number 6. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray, have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's not talking about a physical healing per se in this context. He's talking about you and I being spiritually healed from the iniquity that we have. Amen? Amen. Isn't it an offense to the cross? Every time you and I decide to allow sin back into our life. When Jesus Christ bled and gave His body for your sins and my sins and your iniquities and our iniquities and my iniquities, and then we allow that stuff back into our lives after He suffered and He bled and He died for those. It's an offense to the cross. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and He was afflicted, and yet He opened not His mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Does anybody want to be like Jesus? He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Notice how the people did the transgression, but Jesus Christ performed the cure. Jesus Christ paid the consequences for those transgressions. Verse number nine, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. There is not a father in here who would have their children injured and it would please them. 
Amen. There's not a mother in here whose child would be bruised and that would please them. But God from heaven saw what was going with Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross of Calvary. And in that brief moment that they were separated, God was pleased with the work of Jesus Christ as he suffered and died for you and for me. It says he hath put, to him, uh, put him to grief. In verse number 10, when thou shalt make his soul of an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, and my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of, sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and for me in his body. And so we come today to remember that. We come together today to partake of the Lord's Supper and remember what He did. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And look at verse number 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Amen. All of those things that caused us to be sick. All of those things that caused us to be spiritually ill. The Bible says were placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and He bare them all. All of them. Amen. And he bear them all. It's a rare occurrence that somebody actually bleeds blood and water. As Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross of Calvary, the Roman soldiers took the spear and stuck it into the side of Christ. The Bible describes that blood and water flowed out of his side. Physicians only will know one occurrence in which that can happen where blood and water would flow out of somebody, and that is the occurrence in which someone's heart literally explodes within their body. I believe that's what happened to Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary because He bore so much weight that you and I put upon Him because of our sin and our iniquity that His physical body his heart exploded with the pressure. I believe that's what happened to Christ that day when he took all of our iniquities and infirmities spiritually upon him. It's also a time that we remember his blood. Amen. It's also a time that we remember his blood. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 25, it says, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Not only are we called to remember the body of Jesus Christ and what was bore on the body of Jesus Christ, but we're also called to remember the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Look with me at Levit Leviticus chapter 16 this morning. Is everybody still with me? Leviticus chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 16, we see this also in verses 13 through 16. Look at what it says. It says, And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat. Eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times times the Bible says then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do 
with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat before the mercy seat. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. The Bible describes what you and I have just read here as a picture of what is really taking place in heaven. All of those things that we read about in the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the priests and the temple and all of those furniture that was in there, all of those things were simply a shadow, a picture of things that were really happening in glory. Amen. Amen. Look at Hebrews with me in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, We see that God describes this all taking place in great detail. He says in verse number nine, uh, chapter number nine and verse number six, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. This is what we just read. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Look at verse 9. Which was a figure. Amen. The Old Testament tabernacle, the Old Testament temple wasn't the actual event. Wasn't the actual action. <laughs> it was a figure. It was a shadow of things that would take place in glory. Amen? Amen. He says, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did not did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not this building. See, the tabernacle and the temple in glory wasn't made with hands. It was made by God. Verse number 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to them purify the flesh. Look at verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. You know what he's saying to the Hebrews here? He's saying to them, purge yourself of all of these carnal ordinances that you are performing. Amen. They are dead works. They were just a picture of what really needed to happen. And what really needed to happen was Jesus Christ, after He died on the cross of Calvary, took His own blood, went into the holy place in glory, and sprinkled it seven times on the real mercy seat. Not the shadow, not the picture, but the real mercy seat, not made with hands. And sprinkled it seven times. And atoned for the transgressions of all the people. There's power in His blood. Amen. There's power in His blood. And we remember that today. We remember His body, how it was bruised for us. We remember how it was broken for us. We remember the work of blood. That's why when Mary saw Jesus Christ, what's the first thing Jesus says to Mary? Touch me not. Because 
by the time that that sacrifice was to go before the mercy seat, it was not to be touched by anybody but the high priest. And so as he appears before Mary in the New Testament, he says to Mary, the first thing is, don't touch me. Don't touch me, he says, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. I have not yet sprinkled the mercy seat with my blood. Don't touch me. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ was the real sacrifice. The temple and the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, all of those things. Look, you can find the Ark of the Covenant if you like. <laughs> you can search for the Ark of the Covenant if you like. And there are many people who think that they know where it is. And that's all fine and dandy, but always remember that that is not the real Ark of the Covenant. That the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant is not the real mercy seat. The real mercy seat is in heaven. It had been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's just a picture. And we remember that today. Not only is it a time of memorial, but it's a time of declaration. It's a time of declaration. Amen? Amen. We declare. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And look at verse number 26. He says, For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, what do you do? You do show the Lord's death till He come. Listen, when you show something, you're declaring it. Amen. Amen. When you show something, you're declaring your communion, your association with the thing that you're showing. If you wouldn't, you'd be hiding it. And he says, take the Lord's Supper so that you show the death till He come. We see that we declare our faith in His death by taking the Lord's Supper today. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is absolutely no reason for you to take the Lord's Supper today. Amen. There's no reason for you to take it at all. If you've never been saved, if you've never been born again, why would you declare faith in Jesus Christ if you've never put faith in Jesus Christ? This is all for people who have declared, I have put my faith and my trust in the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Yes. If you've never made that declaration, then why show it? It makes no sense. This is for people who have put their faith and their trust in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We see that here is mentioned in verse 26, For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death. Amen. Over and over and over as we come together to take the Lord's Supper, we're showing that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that we are making a declaration of faith in His death. Amen. Not only that, but we declare our faith in His resurrection. Amen. We declare our faith in His resurrection. Now you know as well as I that the death and burial of Jesus Christ is two-thirds the gospel. The resurrection is one-third of the gospel. But yet how often do we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Not only in all of this are we declaring, yes, we have faith in the death of Jesus Christ, that He died for our sins, that He shed His blood so that our sins could be washed away. We see that. You do show the Lord's death, but let's not forget, till He come. The only way you can show somebody's death till they come, it's kind of an oxymoron. If they're dead, how are they going to, how are they going to appear? How are they going to come to us? Unless they be resurrected. Unless they be risen from the dead. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper here today, not only are we doing this as a remembrance of His body and His blood, but we come together today to declare that we have put our faith in the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That you and I have faith not only in His death, but His resurrection. You do show the Lord's death till He come. 
And we're not going to do communion in the Lord's Supper forever. Amen. The moment that He comes will be the moment that we stop partaking the Lord's Supper. Amen. We are showing our faith and declaring our faith in His death until the time that He appears. Amen. Amen. We see it's a declaration, we see it's a memorial, but we also see it's a time of examination. It's a time of memorial. We remember in this the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us. It's a time of declaration where you and I are declaring to everybody here our faith in His death and our faith in His resurrection. But not only that, but it's a time of examination. Look at, look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Look at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. He says in verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Amen. Amen. He says this is a serious thing. If you take the Lord's Supper unworthily, what happens? Paul says, well, in your church, the church of Corinth, there are many who are sick and many sleep because they did not discern the Lord's body. They didn't take it seriously. Examine yourself today. Examine yourself. Look at what it says in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. How do we take it unworthily? What is taking the Lord's Supper unworthily? Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. If you don't examine yourself, you are not taking the Lord's Supper worthily. You're taking it unworthily. Every one of us are called to examine ourselves in all of this. And let me put this out there for you. I think, first of all, we should examine whether we are in the faith. Amen. Whether we are in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 15, it says this. It says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Amen. What's Paul trying to do? Scare people out of their salvation? No, what he's trying to do is to get them to take their salvation seriously. Are you sure that you have been born again? Are you sure? What is your testimony? Does your testimony look like the testimony of those found in Scripture? Was there a time and a place in which you called upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Amen. Was there a time and a place when you turned from what you were doing to follow Jesus Christ? Amen. The Bible says that Peter left his nets and followed Christ. Jesus walks up to Peter and says, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Amen. Follow me. But in order to follow me, you're going to have to fish for something different. Amen. Amen? Amen? Today we think that we can go on about our lives, that nothing's going to change in our lives, right? That we can keep doing the things we used to do and talking the way that we used to talk, right? Watching the things that we used to watch, and it's not going to bother us. If you're saved and you really came to Christ, it should bother you. Your conscience has been awoken. Amen. And it should bother you. It should bother you. I am not at all saying I am perfect. There are times when I step back and go, how did I do that? Why did I do that? There are times when I step back and go, boy, I really enjoyed doing that. But the difference between me and somebody who's not saved is that my conscience bothers me afterward. Amen. Amen. There are times when I walk away from a conversation, I say, why did I say that? And my conscience bothers me until I get it right. Amen. Amen? That's Amen. the difference. 
It's not the same old, same old. If you're saved and you examine yourself whether you're in the faith, how does your testimony of salvation align with the testimony of salvation of Stephen and Paul or Saul and Peter and Cornelius and all of those who were saved in the New Testament? Has there been a place when you called upon the name of Jesus Christ and, I'm going to put an and in there if you don't mind, and your life was changed. There are plenty of people who call upon the name of Jesus. There are plenty of people who claim to have a born-again experience, but their life doesn't change. Paul says to the church of Corinth, when a man is in Christ, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm not saying that we don't struggle with the same old things that we used to struggle with. I struggle with the same things I struggled with before I was saved. But the Spirit of God is there to convict, convict me. And my conscience is there to bother me. Amen. Amen. Are you still doing the same things that you were doing before you got saved? You should examine whether you're in the faith. Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to scare you out of your salvation, but I'm trying to get you to look at this with fear and trembling. That's why Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You better make sure that your testimony is a real testimony, because I'll tell you something, we live in a day and age when we have a one, two, three, repeat after me salvation. And we have a turn, flip over a new leaf. Oh, I'm saved. Instead of people coming to Christ and their lives being transformed, I question a salvation that does not result in a transformed life. I question it. Amen. I don't take them at their word. Sorry, Joel Olstein, who said the very thing. Well, he said he's saved, so I'll take him at his word. Oh, no. Will you show me in the Bible where the Bible tells us that we're supposed to take people at their word? Never. Amen. Never. It says try the spirits. It says what? By their fruits you shall know them. Yes. Are you saved? Are you truly saved? Have you been born again? Has your born again experience resulted in a transformed life? Are we in the life? We examine ourselves whether we're in the faith. We examine ourselves, are we in the life? What do I mean by that? The life of Jesus Christ. Look at, look at chapter 5. Jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as we move along here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look what it says in verse number 14. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What does he say? He says, if you really love Jesus, you have a constrained life. Amen. If you really love Jesus... There are things that you will not do because of your love and affection for your Savior. Right? The love of Christ constrains us. What does the word constrain mean? It means to hold back. It means to stop. Does the love of Christ constrain you? Does it stop you? Or are you living your life the way you want to live it? Or are you living in his life the way he wants you to live it? Amen. Examine yourself this morning. Are you in the faith? If you are and you say, yes, I've had a born-again experience. I've trusted Christ as my personal Savior, and it's resulted in a transformed life. I'm different in my thinking. I'm different in my being. I'm a new creature, if that's the case. Are you in his life? 
Are you living your life or are you living his life? It's very easy for even people to have had a born-again experience, a true born-again experience, slip back into what they were doing. That's what the Bible calls backsliding. Amen? Amen? Where are you? Are you in the faith? If you are in the faith, are you in the life? The life that Jesus Christ called you to live. He even said to his own disciples, if you love me, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen? Where are you? In the faith? In the life that he called you to live? Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20 says, I, I live this life, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the things that I do, I do not because of me, but I do because Christ lives through me. Amen. That's living the life Christ wants you to live. When you're at the crossroad of temptation, do you choose his way or do you choose your way? The way that's pleasing to you, the way that's pleasing to your flesh, the way that seems to make sense to you, or do you choose his way? If there's a continual pattern in your life of choosing your way, then I got news for you. You're not living his life. You're living your life. Are you in the life? The life that he called you to live. It's a communion. It's a communion. We already looked at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 16. If you go there, you can see that here quickly with me. In chapter 10 and verse number 16, it says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? We see that it's a communion with the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but it's a communion with the body of Christ. Let me, let me share something with you, that when we commune with somebody, it means that we hook our trailer up to their truck. It means that we go where they go. It means that we turn where they turn. It means when they go down a bumpy road, we go down a bumpy road. When we commune with the blood and body of Jesus Christ, it doesn't just mean to identify with it. It means that if Jesus Christ was persecuted, we ought to be persecuted. Amen. It means that if Jesus Christ suffered, we ought to suffer. Amen. Amen? Persecution is a gauge of a godly life. If your persecution gauge is high, guess what? Chances are you're living a godly life. The Bible says, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're living godly, the Bible says, you'll suffer persecution. You cannot live godly without suffering persecution. Amen. And I got news for you. We are entering into a day and age that's been repeated by history since the beginning of time. Amen. Our culture and our country is beginning to persecute Christians. And we've never known that before. You and I are at the dawn of a new era. Amen. We are just entering into an entirely new era, and that is the era of Christians being persecuted for what they believe in. Amen. I'm telling you that as I've been following this, with this whole homosexual movement and all of these things, it is opening the door for you and I because of what we believe in the Bible, to be persecuted by others. And let me tell you that it always starts out political. And political persecution always turns to economic persecution. And economic persecution leads to physical persecution. You look at any society in history, that is the road they've traveled. It starts out political, then it turns to economic, and then it turns to physical persecution. And to be honest with you, we've already passed the political aspect of it. We're now on to the economic aspect of Christian persecution today. It's coming. Are you ready for it? 
Are you ready for it? When you commune with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, you'll be ready for it. Amen. We are, again, at the dawn of a new era when God will separate the mice from the men, so to speak. The fake Christians, the crinos, Christians in name only, will be separated from the real Christians. And we'll find out real quickly. Amen. The only way you'll be able to endure persecution is to be identified with the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Here's the last thing. Unification. It's a time of unification. Amen? Unification. What, what, what do I mean by that? Very simply put, they were obviously unified physically. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verses 18 through 20, we see clearly here Paul was calling them to come together physically. Amen? I think that goes without saying. We see Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7 again says that they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Physically, they were together in the same location. But let me, let me warn you and caution you this morning that just because we're together physically in the same room here this morning does not mean that we are together spiritually. It does not mean that we are together spiritually. Not only were they unified physically, but they were unified spiritually. Let me give this passage of Scripture to you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and look at verse number 18. It says, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, notice what it says, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. What the Apostle Paul is saying in verse number 18 is illustrating exactly what I'm telling you here this morning. He says, when you come together, you're not really together. There's divisions among you. He says, you can come together physically, but even if you come together spiritually, I know that there are, or physically, there are spiritual divisions among you. Amen. He says, I don't want you to come together only physically. It's not a call for us just to congregate together. It's a call for us to come together spiritually. Amen. He says in verse number 19, For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifested among you. Verse number 20, When ye come together, therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Again, he talks about this physical coming together, but let me tell you, we see this in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41. Look, look with me there. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily... In one, with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, did they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all men. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. I want you to notice here that the Bible says that they were together physically. Amen? Amen. It says in verse 44, and all that believed were together. They were there physically together as believers. But Paul takes it a step further and says not only were they there physically together as believers, 
They were there in what he says in verse 46, in singleness of heart. Amen. Amen. We may be here physically together, but are we spiritually together? Or is there divisions among us? And if there are divisions among us for one reason or the other, if we're divided spiritually and not in singleness of heart, let me tell you something. Get that right before you take the Lord's Supper this morning. And if you can't get it right before you take the Lord's Supper, then don't take the Lord's Supper. That's my warning to you. It's my caution. It's my caution because it was Paul's caution. That if there's some kind of division between you and somebody else in this room and you're spiritually divided, physically, yes, we're here. And we give the appearance that we're all united. But spiritually, is there singleness of heart? If the answer is no, then there can only be one action to take. And that's to align ourselves with the standard of God's word. In all of this, as a memorial, as a declaration, as an examination, as a communion, as unification, in all of this, is there something in your life this morning that does not line up with the way God would have you to take the Lord's Supper here today? We here at the church have provided all the physical means to take the Lord's Supper. It's up to you to provide the spiritual means to take it. That means you're ready to declare your faith in Jesus Christ. It means that you're willing to examine yourself. It means that you're willing to come together and commune and not just identify with Jesus Christ, but suffer the way He suffered. That's what communion is. And are you unified? That's how God would have us to take the Lord's Supper here this morning, is to be unified by the death of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to give a moment here for God to speak to your heart through His Word. I'm going to give a moment here this morning for you to get things right with the Lord before we take the Lord's Supper. That if you've examined yourself and you see something's wrong, your life is not the life Jesus would have you to live. We're here physically together, but maybe there's spiritual division among us. Let's take this time to get those things right before we bother with the Lord's Supper. How can we express our love and thankfulness to Jesus Christ who bled and died for us? How can we express that love when we're not willing to be constrained? When we're not willing to keep His commandments? That love constrains us. That love causes us to obey Him. Is there something in your life that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about this morning urging you, get it right. Get it right. God's not waiting to punish you. He's waiting to help you and forgive you. Get it right. If there's somebody here today who there's division against, why don't you get it right with them? As the piano plays, quietly pray and ask God to help you and to show you and to speak to you this morning of things that we need to change. I know God's been speaking to me about things that need to change in my life.
There was a man who lived on a mountain. And he was a great wood carver. A little boy came to visit him one day. Saw all the wood carvings that he had made. They were beautiful. They were lifelike. They were so realistic and detailed. And the boy asked the old man, how did you do that? The boy says, I, I see this. I see this duck over here on this shelf. How did you carve this duck that looks so real? The old man looked at the boy and said, well, son, I just took a hunk of wood and carved away everything that didn't look like a duck. And that's how we need to be with Christ. Is that in our lives, we just carve away everything that doesn't look like Jesus Christ.